Welcome to this next lesson and this one's going to be a little bit different because I'm going to make it inside of Houdini. But don't worry for those of you following along in either my or Gatana because the Pixar nodes are actually exactly the same. And for this example I'm going to be demonstrating the Pixar Vary node. For an extra bonus I'm going to be showing you how the Pixar ramp has got a secret magic extra button inside of it that most people might not know about. Now, the reason I'm doing this in Houdini is that I'm going to be using this motion operator or MOPS for short. So I'm going to be duplicating and then we're going to be randomly colorizing this teapot kit using the Pixar Vary and also this Pixar ramp. So as you can see here, I've got this teapot kit that I've modeled in ZBrush and I've got the front and the back here and then the tops for the lids. And here's the handle and there's a couple of spare ones in case you ever lost one. And for those of you who have been lucky enough to attend Seagraph and get your hands on one of these walking teapots designed by Dylan Sisson, this is exactly how it is made in the factory. So before we get rendering, let me just show you how I set this scene up. So the first thing is that I've got this file import node, which is importing my sprue Alembic model. And then after that, I've got a transform node, so it's now rotating it. And then after that, I've then used this mops instancer to create a grid of four by four. And so this is what we're going to be rendering. And let me just go ahead here and go up to the Render View tab. And then I'm just going to fire off an IPR render. Now to the left here, you can see that I've got a Pixar surface. And into the diffuse color, I've plugged in a Pixar Vary. And this is the node that we're going to be concentrating on for the minute. Now the first thing to look at is that the input color is currently set to orange. And I can go ahead and set this to any color that I want to. But for this example, I'm just going to work with an orange. And so the next option down here is vary source. And we're going to be having a look at a number of different ones here. But for the minute, I'm just going to leave it on identifier name. And then here we can add in a variable name. And again, we'll get to this in a minute. So these next four options here, this is where we can start to begin to influence the hue, saturation, luminance, and gamma. So if I start to increase the hue, you can actually see that now what happens is that well, nothing actually happens. And this is actually a mistake on my part. And the reason for this is that before I started recording, I started to play around with this probability. And for these lessons, I don't normally leave my mistakes in it. I'll actually go back and I'll re-record it without the mistakes. But once I realized that I'd actually set this probability to zero, it actually made more sense for me to now show you what this probability slider does. And by default, it's normally set to one, so you wouldn't really need to worry about this. But because I have actually made a mistake and set it to naught, it's actually quite a good demonstration of what it does. Uh, so at the minute, I've cranked my hue up all the way to one, but because the probability is set to zero, it's actually not having any effect at all. So if I start to increase this probability, and by default, it's set to one, now you can start to see that we're starting to get some random hues to each of my duplicates that have the same name. So the back of the teapot here has the same name and the front here, hence why these are purple and then these are blue. The outer pieces are all called the same thing, hence why they're all yellow. So if you now start to decrease the probability, what happens is that you're less likely for the randomness to affect your models. And so you can see that if I start to increase the probability again, more and more randomness actually starts to happen. So the moral of the lesson is always check your probability to make sure it's not set to zero. Okay, so now let's reduce this hue down a bit and let me show you how this hue works. So you can see that at the minute, our input color is set to orange and this hue will push us to the left and to the right of this position that we are on this color spectrum. So the greater this hue, the wider it will start to search either left or right. And obviously when it gets to red, it starts to come around this side. So you can see that if I move this to green and I take the hue all the way up, it's looking to the left of my color position and it's going into the reds, hence why we're getting these reds here. But it's also going to the right. So it goes through these blues and it also goes into the pinks, hence why we get the blues and the pinks. The other way this works is that this hue mode is set to centered. So if I say take this back down to orange and I take this to additive, what will happen is that it will only go in a positive direction. So it will start with my oranges and it'll only go this way. And if I set it to subtractive, it goes in the opposite direction. So again, you can see here it's gone through the reds and then it's gone into the pinks. 
And so if I start to reduce the hue and effectively how far it's looking to the left of this current color position, you can see now that we're really getting these reds and these pinks. And this is really how all of these saturations and the luminances work. They all have this centered additive and subtractive. Okay, so the next thing I want to show you is how you can change this vary source and how this actually works within Houdini. So if I just change this to primvar, what happens is that all of these now turn green. And in fact, I'm going to turn it back to this orange color. It's a bit more visually pleasing. Now, because I'm using this Mops Instancer and it's taking one and it's now made 16 of them, if I look at my geometry spreadsheet, you can see that I have this parameter here called ID and it goes from zero through to 15. So if I then just come back into my Pixar Vary and by now setting this to Primvar, if I type in ID, what happens is that it's now picking up each of these as their own IDs and in the same way as I was controlling each of the individual pieces, I can now begin to randomize the color of each of these pieces based off their ID value. And again, in the same way, I can go to green and I can change the saturation and I can do the luminance. Now it's time for me to show you this really interesting feature within the Pixar ramp. And I've got to give a shout out to Philippe Le Prince from Pixar because he was the one who showed this to me. And I'd never really found it before, but when I did discover it, it was actually a really interesting feature. And I think you can use it for lots of different things. So the more I played with the Pixar Vary node, the more I realized that what I wanted to do is I wanted to actually control these colors a bit more based off a palette that I wanted to predetermine myself. And this is where the Pixar ramp comes in. So if I take the output RGB and I plug it into the input RGB of the Pixar Vary node, what you'll see is straight off the bat is that actually it doesn't look very good at all. And it's actually spitting out white and my ramp type is set to S ramp. Now, if I just show you here this use ramp UI, you can now see that I've got predetermined palette and still it's not looking very impressive. And this is where the magic option is. Inside of ramp type, if you come all the way down to the bottom here and you're probably all screaming at the computer going, I already knew that was there. If I now set this to random object color, what you'll start to see is that with each of my objects, it's now getting a random color based off this palette here that I've determined in this color ramp. And this is exactly what I was after. And the probability here is actually based off the width of these color slots. So if I wanted more blue, for instance, I could now start to increase this section of the blue. And now you can start to see that more blue has been introduced into my randomness. And again, if I wanted more pink and less blue, I can then control it like that. And the nice thing about this is that I can create presets. So here I've gone ahead and I've created a bunch of little colored presets. And this is such a useful option because the Pixar Vary node is very powerful with things like duplicating rocks and stones and that sort of ilk of objects. But actually when you want to get more kind of motion graphics-y and actually start to control the palettes of your random and your variations, and it's actually a really useful option to be able to do it. And now if I come back to the Pixar Vary node, you can see that I'm driving my input color with our ramp swatches. And in the same way as I was controlling the hue and the saturation before of this color, I'm now able to do it, but off of these predetermined colors from these swatches. So just to summarize this quick lesson is that the Pixar Vary node is really, really powerful and it's useful for loads of different things. But couple that with the Pixar ramp and this extra special random object color parameter, you can really get some amazing things. So I hope you enjoyed this one and I'll see you in the next lesson.